Good morning, everybody. I'm Dan Porterfield with the ASP Institute, and so pleased to be here with my good friend John King, the chancellor of the SUNY system. But John King has held every role you can hold almost now in supporting public education. He was the CEO of the Ed Trust. He was the Secretary of Education in the Obama administration. He was the State Commissioner of Education in New York. I'm working backwards. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, uh, a middle school principal and a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. So he's done it all. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a blast together. And so when I got the assignment that I could interview you, uh, I ran home and told my wife, Karen, I got the best job in this whole summit. <laughs> so big question. Uh, everybody thinks about the climate issues and the energy issues through the lens, of course, of the economy, of the earth, all different aspects of how we live, how we purchase, um, healthcare. But what about education? Why should educators, educational leaders, be engaging in the questions that we're discussing at this summit? Well, thank you for asking that, and Dan, I so appreciate Aspen putting an event like this together and focusing the country's attention on these issues. So, you know, I'd start with the young people. We have 50 million kids in our K-12 schools. We've got 20 million students in our higher ed institutions, and their lives will be profoundly impacted by um, climate change. And so we owe it to them to make sure that they're equipped with the skills and knowledge to navigate that world. Uh, I have a 16-year-old and a 19-year-old, uh, Amina and Maria, and when, when we're talking about climate, they often will say, you know, you older people, you say it's on us to solve the problem. It's really on you all to solve the problem. You created this problem. Don't just leave it to us. And so we have to use the tools that are available to us. And in, in education, you know, think about K-12, 100,000 school buildings. 480,000 school buses, 7 billion meals per year. So there's a tremendous opportunity to leverage the assets of the education sector to tackle climate change. And you uh, took part in a big Aspen project along with Christine Todd Whitman, the uh, former uh, EPA commissioner and uh, Republican governor of New Jersey. And this commission was put together by the Institute to look at the K-12 sector um, and to bring together all kinds of um, leaders, thinkers, students, uh, educators to ask the questions, what can we do? In fact, Laura Shifter is here somewhere and she was the one that envisioned this. That's Laura right there. Thank you, Laura. Um, she woke up at home one day and said, I gotta do more. And then it was her, this is what she brought to the Aspen Institute. Um, well, you were the co-chair of that. So what did you take away from that experience of listening and then recommending? Yeah. You know, it was a great experience, and it was great to co-chair it with Governor Whitman because I thought it sent a powerful signal to have a Republican and Democratic uh, former cabinet members both leading this effort. We had civil rights leaders, educators, environmental activists, and student leaders who were phenomenal. We spent a year listening and, you know, I'll share a couple of examples of things we heard. Uh, one really scary and maybe too hopeful. So the scary one was a school board member from Santa Barbara who spoke at one of our listening sessions. She ran for the school board wanting to call attention to the need for the district to do something on climate. Nobody would listen. She got elected to the school board and she was the one in meetings who would say, why, why aren't we doing electric buses? Why aren't we putting solar panels on this new school building? Nobody would listen. And then there was a drought and then there were mudslides, and there was loss of life, and then the school district mobilized around a plan to get to net zero and uh, to think about resilience across their campuses. And what was scary to me about that is we don't want that to be our collective situation, that we don't act until there's already grievous harm. Uh, on a more hopeful note, we heard a lot of examples of great things that are happening around the country. A teacher from Oklahoma who was nervous about teaching about climate change, worried that, that it might be too partisan. So she started with an issue that all of her students and their families could appreciate. What's our relationship to the land? Yeah. And how do we, whether it's hiking or hunting or fishing, what is our relationship to the land and what will climate change do to our land? Uh, we heard from a leader in Stockton, California, who was working to move the entire school bus fleet to electric. 
and had worked with the school board and built public will around that. Uh, and we also had the opportunity when we were launching the action plan to visit a net zero school in Arlington, Virginia, Fleet Elementary. And during that visit, one of the interesting things, Randy Weingarten, who leads the AFT, the, one of the major national teachers unions, she asked folks, how much more did this building cost than a regular fossil fuel dependent school? And the answer was, it didn't. It cost the same. And that was a really powerful moment for us because it said, we should have a lot more urgency as a country. Why are we building any school or any public building for that matter that isn't net zero today? So say a little bit about the recommendations of yeah. the commission. Yeah, so we, we organized the recommendations first to say there's a set of infrastructure activities that you could engage in, uh, moving buildings to solar, moving your bus fleet to electric, uh, composting, uh, getting, uh, thinking differently about how the food system and, and how you provide meals. Uh, we talked about education. There's science education around climate change, but also in social studies, we should be talking about climate refugees, right? And, uh, and the social implications, that's right, of, of climate change. Uh, there's preparing young people for jobs in, in green industry, renewable energy, resilience. Uh, and then there's the, the potential for schools to be real resilience hubs. I think about Puerto Rico, where, where my mother was born, where my family comes from. There's been a tremendous harm as a result of climate change. But in many cases, schools have been the place where, they, where there was renewable energy, where folks could charge a phone, get on the internet, get food, maybe have shelter. So schools have this tremendous uh, potential as community resilience hubs. Yeah, it's really a 360 look at the whole sector and, and the school, the school bus, the curriculum, the food, as you said, uh, a, a beautiful body of work. So uh, how does the part around racial justice, environmental justice connect into this commission's review? Yeah. You know, we have to start every conversation grounded in issues of racial justice. And I know there are people who want to wish that away, want to pretend that that history didn't happen. Um, Dan, you know, I, I, I lived in, when I lived in Maryland, I lived about 25 miles from where my great-grandfather was enslaved. Right? That's real. That happened. We can't erase that. And there's a legacy. Uh, one example of the legacy of institutional racism is uh, in the city of Baltimore, which we both care a lot about. That's a city where 20% of children have asthma. That's double, more than double the national rate, which is about 9%. Right? That's a result of air pollution tied to fossil fuels and to the location of an incinerator in the city. So if we want to tackle racial justice, we've got to prioritize those communities that have been most negatively impacted. Baltimore should be the first place where the public transit fleet is converted to electric. Yeah. Right? We also have 2 million acres of land around our schools, a lot of asphalt, especially in our cities where, where, where communities are vulnerable to heat islands. We could be converting those asphalt um, properties to green spaces for kids and for communities. And we should prioritize the places that have been most frequently harmed, which are often communities of color. You know, one of the things that we, the Institute, have been invited to consider is the possibility of hosting a summit like this one in Louisville, Kentucky where the outgoing mayor, Greg Fisher, has organized the same kind of 360 group of business leaders, philanthropists, educators, and health leaders. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing in Louisville that's worth mentioning is they're doing a gigantic project to plant 8,000 trees all over the city, but especially in the parts of the city mm -hmm. that where the, the underserved live, where people who are black and brown have lived for generations. What they're doing with the NIH funding it is studying the health impacts of having more shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of reducing pollution, dealing with asthma, dealing with heart disease, and they're documenting this. And what you just said about greening schools is going to end up being validated by the work they're doing there. It's awesome. It's, fun to, it's, it's actually quite fun to see all the innovations that are happening at the local level, which of course you've been able to do as a local leader, but then also as a national leader in this space. Um, well, one of the things that's happening next, we hope, is that there will be a commission on K, on, on, not on K through 12 now, but on higher education. What can our community colleges and our four-year colleges do to, to join 
course they are in many ways, but to really join the climate uh, movement. And what do you think will happen from the Aspen uh, Higher Education Commission? Yeah, there's a tremendous opportunity. So, you know, this is Planet Ed, which is the sort of evolution of the K-12 climate action effort. Now includes an early childhood task force, a children's media task force, and we are launching this higher ed task force that will be co-chaired by Kim Hunter-Reed, who's the commissioner of higher education in Louisiana, and Millie Garcia, who leads the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Higher ed institutions can have a huge impact here. Um, it's facilities, right? At SUNY, we have 40% of the state's public buildings, yeah. right? It's um, green jobs readiness, right? Preparing folks for wind, for solar, uh, and it's research. Uh, we're doing at SUNY Binghamton nation-leading research on battery technology that's essential to helping us get to net zero. So that's a nice transition to uh, your current job, which you've been in for six or seven weeks, <laughs> eight weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the the, uh, uh, the SUNY system is, I think, the with California is the biggest public higher education systems in the country. Sixty-four mm -hmm. campuses. That's right. Um, you just started your role as chancellor. How do you get your arms around something so big and so important to the state of New York and the country? Yeah. Well, look, we have a great opportunity at SUNY because we've got grad schools, four-year institutions, and all of our community colleges in the state. So we, we can have an impact on multiple levels. Uh, I've made clear that climate action is a priority for me as chancellor, and we are in the process of appointing an executive director of climate action to work across our campuses to support climate action. Uh, we've got to move faster to get to net zero. Uh, we will hit our target of a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, uh, but we want to get to an 85% reduction at least yeah. by 2050. To do that, we've got to accelerate our work in buildings. Um, we are uh, critical to our, the state's ability to hit our uh, renewable energy targets. We've got to train the workforce at our community college campuses in particular. Um, and then we've got to expand our research work. So at Stony Brook, they're doing tremendous research on resilience and what do we do about shorefront communities and the impact that climate change will have on them? How do we think about making transportation more resilient in New York City, for example? Uh, we've got folks at Albany doing incredible work on atmospheric science, uh, thinking about changing patterns of precipitation and drought across the country. We've got environmental science and forestry school in, in Syracuse where they're doing great work on sustainable agriculture. So I, I think higher ed has a responsibility to help society grapple with our biggest challenges. And, and this is our biggest existential threat. Yeah. So how do you as chancellor um, help all those different campuses in their research agenda? Is it largely to um, stay out of the way? Is it to give them some guidance? To, to, uh, to, you know, what does it mean to support so much research? Yeah. Well, a lot of it is about facilitation. I uh, want to make sure we get as many federal dollars as possible. You know, so that Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we want a lot of those resources to come to New York to support research. So we're helping folks with thinking through grant applications. Uh, we want our, our institutions to partner with communities to tackle environmental justice issues. It's another place where there's federal funding that we can go get. Uh, there's private philanthropy and trying to persuade philanthropists to invest in our campuses to support that research. There's helping our campuses recruit diverse faculty members to engage in that research. There's funding undergrads to do research that hopefully will lead them to choose careers in climate science. So we're thinking a lot at the system level, how do we support this and then how do we connect our institutions so that we might have um, one institution that's doing the sort of cutting edge research partnering with another institution that is training the workforce we need for that industry. Yeah. So all across the country, people are asking about questioning the value of higher education. It comes at us from all different angles and perspectives. And it's always worries me when it comes from the mouth of younger people, when they say, well, why should I do that? Why should I think about college? Not that college should be for everybody or there's one model, but how are you thinking about that question of the public's interest in and perhaps doubts about the value proposition? Yeah. 
Well, look, I'm, you know, part of it is, is helping folks see the economic opportunity that lies on the other side. You know, it's still true that on average, a college graduate is going to make a million more dollars over the course of their lifetime. So there's a very instrumental case that's about how do I get a good job that will provide a family sustaining wage and benefits. But then there's a broader societal case about citizenship and how do we prepare a next generation of citizens to navigate issues like climate change, to bring us closer yeah. to the promise of a just society. And then there's a much more deeply personal, um, how do I lead the good life, right? This, yeah. is, this is the ultimate yeah. Aspen <laughs> question, yeah, right? And I was just at SUNY Fredonia a uh, day before yesterday, and I was talking to students who are majoring in engineering or physics, but they are also cello players and uh, in the theater program. And they are finding a way to blend their passions and pursue their passions. And hopefully higher ed is that gift as well. Yeah. So you mentioned, we mentioned in the K through 12 commission that you and uh, Governor Whitman were the co-chairs, a Republican and a Democrat. In some ways, it's just as interesting that Randy Weingarten was on it because there's probably any number of issues over the years where Randy Weingarten has said, John King, you've got this wrong. Um, so how do you create the space for people who are coming at issues from different perspectives in some ways to find the common ground to do something together? Yeah. Well, look, uh, you know, um, you know, John Lewis had this saying, he would say, uh, we came here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. <laughs> um, and it's true, right? The consequences of climate change will be felt by all of us, all of our communities. And so I think there is tremendous opportunity here for bipartisan collaboration, for labor management collaboration, for cross-sector collaboration, educators sitting next to folks who do renewable energy work, sitting next to folks who do transportation. Yeah. And the truth is, if we don't do that kind of uh, collaborative approach, we won't make the progress we so, need to. So you're, you're extraordinary at your ability to sit around a table and listen and engage and allow others to feel heard, whatever the starting point. Um, often it's generational um, as we get older. So. <laughs> Um, what do you do yourself to put your sensibility in the right place to engage with someone who may be skeptical about even engaging with you? Mm. You know, it's, it's sort of what you try to do as a teacher, right? Which is you, you try to listen to um, people's authentic needs and find the place where they're you know, able to share their perspective. Uh, one has to be disciplined about that. I'll tell you one quick story. So uh, I was, when I was Secretary of Education, uh, we did a lot of work on mentoring of particularly uh, boys and young men of color. That was, a, that was a priority project. We had this My Brother's Keeper initiative. And we had a meeting, uh, the president and a few cabinet members, with um, some young men who were participating in a White House mentoring program. And one of the young men asked President Obama, you know, what are the keys to success in life? And he said two things, which I always remember. It's a very powerful conversation, you know, just a few of us at lunch. And the president said, well, one is I learned in college I was never going to let anybody outwork me. I may not be the most talented person walking in the room, but I'm not going to lose out to someone else because they worked harder than I did. And the second thing he said was having the ability to see the world from somebody else's perspective. And he talked about both having lived a multiracial, multicultural life in different places and how that helped him to see the world from other perspectives. You know, seeing the world from the perspectives of his you know, white Midwestern grandparents, yeah. right? Um, but then he also talked about literature. And I think about this a lot in conjunction with the work that Aspen does. He talked about how when you read a novel or you read an um, autobiography, you get to inhabit someone else's worldview. You get to see the world from some, through somebody else's eyes. That ability to do perspective taking, that empathy, yeah. he described as making him a better leader and ultimately a better person. Yeah. And 
you know, I try very much to say how, how, to make myself think about how would it feel to be in the other person's situation. And I think if we could all do that a little bit more, we'd have a healthier society. Yeah. That's a great note to conclude on. Thank you so much, John.